you all for joining us. Woodland Wildlife Wednesday. Okay, Karen, I gotta ask. What, do you have a favorite insect or top three? Hmm. Well, we can have people maybe put uh, their favorite insect into the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like- Ooh, I'm gonna ask that, that is a good question. I don't know. I mean, I like caterpillars a lot. Um, and so there'll be pictures. I think I'll show pictures of glass slug caterpillars, which I really like. They're transparent. Um, yeah, I could just give you, I could just give you three caterpillars. Um, I would really like leaf miners and gall makers as well. And there'll be some pictures of those. Um, yeah, I can't choose. I, I, I study kind of the diversity of insects. And so I'm really not uh, focused on one particular one. I think they all kind of add their own thing. Yeah, I get it. It's like picking a favorite child or a favorite <laughs> pet. I get it. I get it. They all have their unique thing th that you love. I will say, uh, and you know, this may not be the most popular answer. Okay. What I'm about to say here is that spotted lanternfly is just so pretty. Like if I'm just going on looks alone, <laughs> that, that spotted lanternfly uh, is so pretty. But, it, it, you know, and, and the idea that it has all those instar stages is kind of a little bit mind boggling for me. Um, not that we're, you know, we're everybody, we're just talking insects right now. Uh, what are our favorites insects and, um, but I will say, um, I don't think I have a specific butterfly that I love the best, but I have a fondness for the monarchs because I went to, um, uh, you know, in Ontario, Canada, there's an, a place called Peely Island, and um, that's where they congregate in the trees and on their way to Mexico. And that was a magical moment. So monarchs have definitely a special place in my heart for sure. Yeah, I've seen them in their spot in Pacific Grove. Uh, there are some conglomerations there that you can see uh, in the winter. They actually overwinter there rather than in Mexico. Um, Where's Pacific Grove? Where's that? It's in California, it's near Asilomar. Um, there's a few spots over on the, on the California coast where there's another kind of migration path. Um, but yeah, the spotted lanternflies are very pretty. Um, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of them in Maryland this year, for sure. Um, I have, my in-laws are in the Philly area and um, th I was inundated with photos, even in like downtown, like Fishtown in uh, Philadelphia, there were spotted lanternfly nymphs all over their little patios in the backyards and they're everywhere. Um, it's pretty impressive. So when they come here, we will definitely be seeing lots of them. Um, and they are pretty, but man, the amount of honeydew something that large can produce <laughs> is, is going to be a lot on people's uh, porches and everything else. And I'm just hoping that they don't end up, it doesn't end up increasing the amount of um, pesticides that we're using in these landscapes. Right, right. Smushing, smushing, smushing. Yep. Okay, y'all. Great. So that was Karen and I, you know, we're already talking insects. So welcome to Woodland Wildlife Wednesdays. We were talking about our favorite insects. And hey, if you want to let us know what your favorite insect is, type that in the chat. We're, we're open to hearing it. I, you know, I maybe had a little bit of a controversial one. Karen's right now today. She loves, she's loving the caterpillars. So she's going to show us some. So hi everybody, let's let's start our introduction. Welcome, happy St. Patrick's Day. So today's webinar, we're gonna talk about track signs and stories of Maryland insects that may already be in your woods. So here are just a few native insects that are beneficial to, to Maryland. Um, I wanted to let y'all know next month's Woodland Wildlife Wednesday is creating a bird-friendly yard Sam um, Pitts, okay, there's her last name. I was like, what is her last name? Sam Pitts from Pickering Creek Autobond is gonna be telling us about um, bird-friendly yards and helping us get acquainted with the birds in our yard. Interesting that we have the insects and then birds. Hmm, interesting, interesting what we're gonna find out two weeks in a row. 
So I wanted to remind everybody that the webinar is being recorded. Thank you all for staying on the line. By you staying on the line lets us know that you're okay with it being recorded. So we appreciate that because we're going to be able to post this webinar at, uh, on our website at extension.umd.edu uh, backslash woodland. Um, and I wanted to tell you that it's being recorded and um, that Taylor, our roadie, so I'm Agnes from uh, the University of Maryland Extension forestry team and Taylor in the background there, you might see her name there, Taylor Robinson. She's the, she's the roadie, you know, uh, if you've been with me for a few of these, you know that Taylor's our roadie, we're doing the recording and um, she'll also be muting people because upon entrance, this program mutes and turns people's videos off. So she will just be making sure that everything go smooth so um, that we can stay focused. So benefits for registering, at, if you've registered for one of these already, you already know that um, you're getting signed up for the quarterly branching out newsletter, a great newsletter if you want to find out about forestry and forestry events in uh, Maryland. Um, if you want to opt out on that, hey, you can uh, email Pam Thomas at pthomas at umd.edu. We hope that you have questions and comments. Um, Karen is really inviting for comments and questions. And we're gonna try and hold some of these questions at the end. So Karen will do her talk and then we'll do the question period at the end. Um, so hopefully when you have a question, you're gonna type it in that, um, in that chat box and um, we'll be able to get to those questions. So today's webinar uh, is Track Signs and Stories of Maryland's Insects that May Already Be in Your Woods. A small minority of insects and pests of invasive and pest insect species receive the lion's share of media attention in forest ecosystems. All the while, the vast majority of insects are quietly performing key ecosystem services and functions as pollinators, decomposers, herbivores, and predators. These amazing critters use a diversity of strategies to survive within, within even relatively small forest patches. In this talk, Karen will highlight the natural history stories of a variety of Maryland insects that are likely residents of forest patches near you and describe, and describe ways that you can look for the tracks and signs of these interactions in the coming seasons. This is great spring-like weather. Oh my gosh, I'm excited about this. So Karen is our uh, presenter today and she is an associate professor in the entomology department at the University of Maryland and a research associate at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. They have really great wooded trails there at CERC. Um, that's just in, I think it's in Edgewater there. Very great wooded trails, uh, very beautiful there. Uh, so trained as a community ecologist, she specializes in understanding plant insect interactions in human modified landscapes, ranging from suburban yards to abandoned agricultural fields to managed forests. By examining how human management practices alter the support of biodiversity in these spaces, the lab's research program helps determine best practices for how humans can share space with a variety of flora and fauna. Karen received her master's and PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Yale University, working with Oswald Schmitz on herbivore-induced defenses in goldenrod plants. Prior to that, she, reserved her bachelor, she received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Delaware, working with Douglas Talame on the role of non-native plants in ecosystems. So, um, I hope that uh, Karen will show her lab website because she has a website that she can um, share for some of the work that she's doing. So I am in Talbot County, Maryland. And uh, so I'm uh, like mid shore, Eastern shore. Where are you guys from? Let us know in the chat. Where are you guys joining us from? Are you guys joining us from uh, Baltimore, Baltimore County? Maybe you're from Allegheny County. Whoa, a few hours from us. Uh, Karen, what county are you in? 
Um, I'm in Prince George's, uh, so just just down the street from the University of Maryland College Park campus. Great, great. So welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, it's a nice spring day. I'm hearing the birds chirping. I wonder what insects they're eating. And uh, let us know what your favorite insect is if you haven't already. Type that in the chat. Let us know. Um, and with that. Karen, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you want to take it over. All right, I will do that. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thanks, Karen. And can everybody see my screen? Give me a thumbs up, Agnes, if, if we look good now. All right, excellent. Um, so as Agnes mentioned, um, I am an assistant professor in the entomology department at the University of Maryland. Um, and I'm going to be talking today less about some of the research that the lab does and more about some of the natural history stories of organisms that I encounter in habitats around here. Um, I'm happy to share information about my website and maybe Agnes will invite me back to talk a little bit more about our research program. But basically what I'm going to be doing today is focusing on track signs and stories of Maryland insects. And really I'm going to be focusing on things that you might be um, encountering just right now in the spring as things are waking up and thinking a little bit about where all of these creatures went during the winter. So first off, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit, um, talk a little bit about why um, I think that you should care about insects um, and hopefully will convince you um, that they're worthy of your attention and conservation. Um, and then go through a number of different insect stories, kind of where are they now out, out in the landscape. And then finish with um, a little bit of a plug for why any wooded properties that you maintain are really important for the conservation of these species. So, I'm a community ecologist, as Agnes mentioned. Um, I'm really interested in plant insect interactions in particular. Um, so I'm fascinated by the fact that insects have pretty much figured out ways to utilize every single part of a plant out there in the landscape. Um, and here I've just illustrated kind of a host of different um, ways that uh, insects utilize host plants. So caterpillars you might be most familiar with um, are external leaf chewers that are really feeding on whole leaves. But then we have lots of other strategies like gallers um, that induce changes in plant tissue and then feed within it. Here's another example here. Um, the, this is an oak gall, an apple oak gall that you may have seen in oak trees around your property. Um, we've also, we also have insects that have figured out how to feed inside cell contents. So lace bugs are mesophyll feeders. They, peer, they um, pierce their sucking mouth parts into the leaf and then uh, wriggle them around, disrupting all the cell contents and then slurp up uh, kind of those cell contents. And that's how you get that stippling damage uh, from lace bugs. Um, so there's just a whole host of different strategies that insects have figured out to use plant tissue on the landscape. And that's really what first got me fascinated and interested in, in these creatures. Now you'll, you'll see through my talk that I have kind of a particular bias toward caterpillars. Um, and, uh, but I'll be talking about all kinds of different groups of insects today throughout the talk. And so as Agnes mentioned, um, I'm really interested in how human management alters plant insect interactions. And forests are one of these really important managed ecosystems. So I've looked at suburban systems and urban systems and old fields, um, but much of the work I'm doing now is um, in a managed forest restoration project uh, called Biodiversity that's at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And understanding how we can manage restoration and reforestation of landscapes is, is really important for conserving these species. So I, I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee um, and spent 18 years there um, before going up to um, Delaware for undergrad um, and Yale for grad school. 
and then came back here about five years ago to do my postdoc and then start as assistant professor at Maryland. And so basically when I think of forested habitats, my default goes back to what I experienced um, in the Appalachians um, in kind of upland forested habitats. Um, but because I've spent the last, oh, second half of my life, basically on coastal habitats, I have a deep appreciation for um, kind of coastal forest habitats as well. And so much of what I'm going to be talking about today is relevant both to kind of um, Piedmont forested habitats and then the coastal plain. So why, why am I arguing that you should care about insects at all? Um, well, for one thing, they're beautiful, if you ask me. Um, and this is a glass slug caterpillar that I was mentioning is one of my favorites. Um, it's basically transparent and it loses all of these tentacles before it pupates. Um, and so you end up with a little, a little uh, cocoon and a just kind of um, amalgam of tentacles all over your rearing container. It looks like something terrible has happened, but it's pretty fun. Um, and so I would argue that there's kind of intrinsic worth to, to just these creatures being out there in the world. Um, but I also think that understanding how they're interacting with their environment and surviving is another thing that gives them value. So I'm putting up this picture um, of a caterpillar now, and I want, um, I want you guys in the chat uh, to, to kind of uh, put into the chat if you have any ideas about why this caterpillar might have um, this yellow line sort of going down the side of the caterpillar's body. Um, now this was a caterpillar that fell down out of the canopy um, onto a street. And I was trying to figure out sort of what this caterpillar ate so I could put it back on its host tree. Um, caterpillars tend to only eat uh, one type of, of host plant once they've started their life. And so I needed to figure out which of the massive oaks this guy was feeding on. So I created a cafeteria of um, a cafeteria of different leaves. I think I had oak, oak, uh, willow oak leaves, um, post oak, white oak, and sort of let this caterpillar decide what to eat. And I came back a few hours later and could not find the caterpillar. And I was like, how did this caterpillar escape? And so some people are saying in the chat here that it looks like the stem of the leaf and to match the leaf margin or stem, um, and you guys are correct. So this is why I could not find this caterpillar. Um, basically what it does is it feeds along the stem and then uses the side of its body to pretend like it's actually a leaf edge. And so it took me a long time to find this caterpillar, but I feel like just witnessing how this caterpillar is actually um, surviving up in the canopy and avoiding being um, predated by a bird or some other um, herbivore just kind of gets you a little bit closer to the, the interactions um, that are going on around you. And so I'm going to argue that it's these kind of interactions and the behaviors out there in the landscape that's another reason to care about these insects. But if, if that, if uh, kind of these intrinsic arguments aren't enough for you, um, these are also really important parts of food webs. So insects, herbivores in particular out on the landscape are a really important conduit, um, moving the energy that plants harvest from the sun to higher trophic levels. Um, the biomass of insects on the landscape at any time is at least nine times the biomass of mammals and birds that are out there. And they're really important food sources for birds, um, particularly to feed their young. So 96% of birds out there in the landscape, when they are um, feeding their offspring, they particularly use these little fat protein packets of insects um, to make sure that they are successful out there. And there's many other um, creatures that use these resources. Um, so grizzlies, for example, um, can feed on up to 40,000 moths per week. Um, foxes, uh, coyotes, lots of organisms you wouldn't think about uh, using insects really have insects as a very major component of their diet. So they're really important for kind of supporting the food web writ large, um, but they also do a lot of ecosystem services that we don't think about. So I suspect that you've heard about kind of the importance of insects for pollination that's out there uh, in the media a lot at this point. 
Um, but I want to emphasize that they do all kinds of other things on the landscape too. So insects are important decomposers, um, basically creating um, available nutrients for trees to uptake in the following year. Uh, they're important for nutrient cycling in habitats. And the maintenance of kind of a baseline level of insects out on the landscape basically uh, means that we can maintain natural enemies that then if pests come in, um, are able to contain those pest outbreaks and prevent them from becoming really destructive. And so there's all of these more nuanced um, services that, that insects are providing for us. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is um, not <laughs> these uh, more flashy mobile life stages that we tend to notice. And um, they're lovely and I, would, I will um, be happy to be invited back to talk more about these flashy mobile life stages. But what I want you to realize is that for each of these kind of um, really beautiful um, organisms, there is an entire life cycle that surrounds that organism. So here on the left, we have a Cecropia moth, um, which you guys probably are hosting in, in woods if you have them. Um, and on the right is a rose mallow bee. And so if you have swamp, um, uh, swamp mallow, for example, that blooms uh, kind of in your forest area, I uh, would challenge you to go out and look in the um, blooms in the spring. And I, I strongly suspect you will find one of these male um, rose mallow bees occupying one of these blooms. These blooms only open for one day. And these are territorial males that basically guard a female, a flower and uh, wait for female bees to come to them. So, what I want you to consider is that insects are actually living these complicated lives. Um, so Agnes mentioned the instars of uh, spotted lanternfly and how they move through multiple instars. And that's actually a really good example of one way that insects can move through life, their life stages. And that is gradual metamorphosis. So a number of insects, um, an egg is laid and then a little, a little insect hatches out and it goes through these successive instars where each instar it's shedding its exoskeleton. Um, these guys can't, uh, don't have internal skeletons like us, they have exoskeletons. And so each of these is called an instar. And basically your little insect just gets bigger and bigger and looks more and more like an adult until finally as an adult, they tend to have wings. And so this is called gradual metamorphosis. And these insects are generally feeding on the same plant as nymphs and adults. Um, they do need overwintering habitats and things like that. Um, and the types of insects that are primarily using this strategy are things like hemipterans, plant hoppers, um, lace bugs, tree hoppers. Those are, those are maybe what you've come across in the past. Now there's an even more complicated uh, life, lifestyle and that's complete metamorphosis. And this can kind of be epitomized by um, either a moth or butterfly life cycle or here a, um, a lady beetle is, is represented. And here you have eggs that hatch and have larval stages that aren't really very closely um, related to what the adult will ultimately look like. And as, as it goes through larval instars, um, that organism will pupate. And in this pupal stage basically will reform into an adult um, that often has a very different lifestyle than the larva does. And this is kind of an amazing superpower um, because what it means is that the larval stages are kind of separated from the adults in terms of how they use habitat. Um, so the larvae are often, um, so here the um, larvae and adults are doing the same thing. They're mostly predators, although they might feed on different things. But for moths and butterflies, for instance, the larvae are herbivores and the adults are often feeding on nectar or not feeding at all. And so they can use different resources and sort of move their risk around the landscape. Um, but what this does is it basically creates the need for a number of different types of habitats. So for example, if we go back to this rose mallow bee that we have here, um, this, this bee actually creates nests. It's a ground nesting bee. So the female creates a turret type nest in the ground and compacted soil near water. 
and then takes this um, hibiscus pollen, they're specialized on hibiscus, and creates a little chamber for its offspring to live on as larva underground. So that's what I mean. The adults are doing something very, very different than what the larva are doing. And here on the left, this cecropia moth, you can see um, the cocoon that it, it's come out of over here. So that, that cocoon overwinters. And so that needs a different type of habitat than say this adult does where it's looking um, for mates and other things. So these insects need a huge range of different habitat types to get through that whole life cycle. And so they need host plants, um, like I mentioned for caterpillars, um, they need adult food, although some of the adults don't eat. Um, they need shelter from heat, predators, wind, flooding. They need overwintering sites and correct temperature cues and pupation sites and egg laying sites. And it almost can become a little bit overwhelming. Um, all the things that um, these insects need to just kind of get through the year and um, present themselves to you as an organism out in the landscape. And let me just bring this home with um, the state insect of Maryland. So this is the Baltimore checker spot. And its host plant is primarily white turtlehead, although in uh, later in their in stars, they, if white turtlehead isn't available, they may feed on some other things. And this is what its life cycle looks like. Um, so basically, um, these guys fly in the summer uh, when you might see them. They lay an egg on a turtle head. The egg hatches in that summer. It feeds for the first three instars. Um, and then they uh, actually go into a dormant phase at the base of the plant as a fourth instar larva. And they go through the winter as a larva underneath the plant. And then they emerge in the spring um, and start feeding on the next round of white turtle head that's there. And so this insect actually is the state insect of Maryland, but it hasn't, it isn't found often in this state anymore. Its range is mostly to the north of us up in Massachusetts. There's very few breeding sites left of this. And so this, the more similar insect that you may actually see regularly is silvery checker spot. So um, this I find on uh, Rubecchia, um, but a bunch of different asteraceous plants can host it. And here you can see caterpillars feeding in this really common uh, kind of window painting way. And these guys have a similar life cycle where they overwinter as larva at the base of the plant. And so timing and accurate cues here are really critical in, in this whole life cycle. I just want you to get the idea that this is a pretty ex exquisitely timed cycle. Each stage is really dependent on the last. And here, I wanna emphasize that probably one of the reasons why we no longer are finding Baltimore trucker spot here in Maryland is that heat waves in the summer are really decreasing the overwintering success of these organisms in these habitats. And so I'm not going to be talking more about Baltimore checker spot today, but just kind of I want you to keep in mind that each of these organisms we're talking about has this um, really interesting uh, life cycle that we have to think about their conservation in the context of. So now I'm going to now I'm going to jump into some insect stories that are really based on where are they now? Um, where are these organisms out in the landscape while everything is looking kind of dull and gray? And so one option that insects have is they can leave. Um, so in the background here, I have a picture of a sleepy orange caterpillar. And this is a group of organisms that feed on senna that you might have. Uh, Maryland senna is a native in this area. Um, and it actually just um, goes south and overwinters um, in sort of warmer climes. And so one option these creatures have is actually to leave. But most of them don't leave. So this is just a picture of a bunch of caterpillars that I, I've collected off of um, this uh, tree restoration experiment. And all of these caterpillars have to figure out a way to make it through the winter here in Maryland. So where do these critters actually go in the winter in, in these forests? And I want to I want to bring up that winter is a pretty costly challenge for these guys. So. Uh, this is a picture I took along the Tuscarora Trail um, in Western Maryland. And this is an ice storm that happened a few years back. And so you can imagine that um, 
over the course of the winter, any insects that are kind of exposed out on these branches or at twigs um, or even close to the ground surface are going to be coated in ice and they have to be able to kind of get through um, this extreme environment. And at this time, there's few foliage and floral resources. Um, there's high metabolic costs of cold temperatures. And you can either be um, killed directly by freezing or from desiccation. Uh, you also have high predation pressure from the birds and mammals that are still kind of around this area. And so one of the things that a lot of these insects do is they use a variety of different strategies. So I mentioned um, kind of migration or moving is one option. Um, but there's also kind of avoidance of the cold or using dormancy or hibernation. And typically in these stages, you don't want to be found um, because uh, these birds and mammals are highly motivated um, to find any and all insects out there and eat them. And so often these are not the flashy life stages um, that, that we're used to seeing during the, um, the springtime months. So each strategy here has its own costs and benefits. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is that basically any wooded fragment patches that are left um, are really amazing habitat for many of these critters to overwinter in. And we can kind of um, find these things by not necessarily looking just for the insects themselves, but for kind of signs that these insects were there. Um, so here on the left, I have a picture of a, a pupil case on snow. Um, and so you can see kind of shed um, exoskeletons or um, pieces of, of um, some of their parts of their life cycle. Um, in the middle here, you have an egg that's been laid on a prunus serotina, a black cherry leaf, um, that's being investigated here by what looks like kind of a pile of fluff and trash, um, but which actually under this pile of fluff and trash, there is a lacewing uh, larva. That's a voracious predator um, that, piles, um, that piles debris onto its back to camouflage itself. So if you ever see a little bit of fluff wandering around, uh, feel free to flip it over and you'll probably see some little legs um, and some voracious uh, pincers at work under them. Um, so yeah, we can look for things like egg sacs um, or eggs. And then you can also look for kind of the traditional way that maybe we would track mammals uh, in the woods and that's through um, droppings. So if you look closely, you can see that all of these are little frass um, pellets, which is sort of the nice word that we use for insect poop, um, all over kind of a pavement. So if you ever are walking along and you see kind of these little frass pellets on the ground, you should look up um, because most likely you have some kind of outbreak of caterpillars above you in the canopy. Um, if, uh, if you've ever been in a a forest that's having a gypsy moth outbreak, for example. Um, I, was, I was in one in Shenandoah in the early 2000s. And you could actually just hear the frass falling around you, which was disconcerting. Um, I don't recommend it. Um, but looking for little piles of frass can actually be a really good way uh, to find caterpillars. This is also good if you have hornworms on tomatoes, for example, put out a sheet the night before, look for frass underneath, um, and then you can find the hornworms that are attacking your tomatoes. Um, other ways you can find insects are through kind of signs they leave in leaf tissue. So here's an example of a leaf miner uh, caterpillar. So this um, caterpillar laid, or the adult laid an egg in the stem the, it hatched, the larva fed up the, um, the stem of this leaf and then emerged out and then created a tunnel feeding, here's the actual larva, um, up, this, up this leaf. And so that signature of that leaf mine is sort of remains on the leaf for you to find later in the year. On the right, we have a galling species um, that creates these really crazy structures um, in plant tissue on oaks in the experiment that I work in. So we can kind of use these tracks and signs to, to figure out uh, where these insects are even in the winter. And I just bring, I just bring up um, this to mention that, um, you know, 
what are the life stages that are actually overwintering out there? And the answer is any and all life stages are overwintering, uh, particularly in Lepidoptera. So these are the moths and butterflies. Uh, we find insects that are overwintering in the east here in all, all, all four different stages. Um, other groups tend to have um, a bias. So the beetles, for example, um, tend, to, tend to overwinter a little bit more as adults. Um, flies tend to overwinter as larva and pupa and are less likely to do so as adults. So we don't have a great handle on what all these guys are doing, but this is just to give you a sense that um, we really have a diversity of strategies to make it through the winter. And um, in, in kind of forested habitats, there are a wide variety of places these insects can spend the winter safely. And so what I'm gonna do is just briefly go through a few different types of um, habitat spaces that you probably have kind of on your property or in any wooded landscape um, that can be used by insects and give you a few examples of who might be there. So first of all, um, the soil is, is actually a very important place uh, for insects to overwinter. So that little bit, that little layer um, right below the surface stays much warmer uh, than the soil surface itself. And so if insects can get down a couple inches um, below that soil surface, they are going to be encountering much less severe uh, cold temperatures during the winter. And so here is um, a rustic sphinx caterpillar. Um, these guys, I found this on a, uh, an ash tree and it, it fed voraciously for, for many weeks. And then at a certain point, it, turned, it started turning pink and uh, kind of walking around its rearing cage. And at that point, I knew that it wanted to find a pupation site. And so I went and I put it on an ash tree. It, it very quickly walked down the tree all the way to the ground and started uh, digging a pupation chamber. And so these guys actually dig a very deep hole. This is a large caterpillar, probably four inches long at least. Um, and it will overwinter, it will spend the winter down in that hole. And so I think an important thing here is that soil disturbance uh, can be really detrimental to organisms like the rustic sphinx that are spending that time over winter. Um, so things like adding mulch or soil compaction, um, they all might make it so that this organism couldn't emerge successfully in the spring. Um, here's another example. So right now, um, probably in the next few days, uh, if there's a next warm day, you can probably go out and find this species of bee. So these are ground nesting bees um, in the genus Coletes, um, and you will see them kind of digging these, uh, these burrows in, in the soil. And these guys actually overwinter as adults kind of below the soil surface. Um, they emerge and mate and create pollen filled chambers in these nests um, for their larvae to feed on. And what I, what I discovered is that if you go to this exact same space um, in April, this is what you see. So, um, you can see this blister beetle kind of digging at the exact same location where this uh, cellophane bee, cellophane bee made, a, made a nest in March. And um, blister beetles in general feed on plants. Um, so as adults, they feed on service berry and um, walnut and, and things that are typically in forests. But it turns out they have a crazy life history strategy um, where as a larva, they actually are parasites of the pollen that these colitis species collect in these um, nest and put in these nesting structures. So this beetle will lay eggs, the eggs will hatch and actually the first instar beetle larva has to go out and try to search for these um, nests of the Colides bee here on the left. And then they feed on that stored pollen that was supposed to be for the Colides um, babies and uh, use that for their own uh, kind of development instead. So see if you can kind of see either of these, um, but there's an extra complication here because if these blister beetle larvae might not get the pollen if the cuckoo bees actually get there first. And so in the same, in the same little area, while the Kalides uh, is making their nests, um, 
You also will often see these Fakoti species. They have a red abdomen um, and they don't collect um, pollen on their, on their legs. And these guys are cuckoo uh, bees and they do not actually uh, create brood cells of their own. Instead, they find other bees nests, in including colides, and will lay their eggs um, in there, kill the, kill, kill the colides babies and use that nest site themselves. Um, so uh, the, another species that you will find in close association is nomada. They're also a cuckoo bee. I don't know if either of these actually um, parasitize the nest of the Calides I saw, um, but it's really cool to have kind of a complete ecosystem that's happening um, on many south facing slopes. So to find these guys, all you need to do is go out, find a south facing slope where there's some bare soil. And I bet in the next few weeks, you will find um, nests of some of these Calidae species. Um, and so basically the, um, the blister beetles and these guys are parasites on the Calidae bee themselves. So one other thing to watch out for in the coming months is there's many, many species of ground nesting bees. Um, these are amazing creatures that often have pretty tight relationships uh, with our native plant species. Um, but this is, this is an image um, actually from our, a forest out near Cirque. And what you can see is an aggregation of Andrena uh, bees. They really like these kind of um, exposed bare ground areas. And you can just see the many, many uh, ground nesting andrina that are using this habitat. And these guys are uh, often specialists that are really important to our spring ephemerals in the area for successful pollination. So I, I recommend uh, kind of keeping your eye out for these guys. So the soil surface is another really important uh, substrate. So why am I showing you a picture of some moss with some um, kind of uh, things scattered on it? Well, each of these little tiny um, sort of pellet looking things on this uh, moss surface is actually an individual insect. And so these are um, individual galls that um, you will often find on oak trees in this area. And so this, it turns out, is actually um, a neurotourist species. They're called jumping gall wasps. Um, and what they do is they form a gall on the oak trees. And at a certain point, they detach uh, from the tree, from the leaf. They fall down and just create a rain of little, little insect uh, galls. They actually will jump, which is why they're called uh, jumping gall wasps, because there is a little larva inside each of these little capsules. Um, and then they will overwinter just at the base of the tree. They, they jump in order to find a nice little spot on the soil surface to uh, make it through the winter, and then they will emerge in the spring. Um, they also have a really cool sexual, asexual alternating life cycle, which I can talk about if anybody's interested. But if you're walking around and you see these really tiny um, little galls, they can be in the hundreds of thousands to millions. Um, that is uh, something to look out for. Um, another kind of user of this soil surface are bumblebees. So this is a bumblebee that I found um, just in the woods over at the edge of our neighborhood. And these bumblebee queens um, overwinter alone, kind of just in, in uh, leaf litter areas. So this is an illustration of their life cycle. And basically um, these bumblebees uh, mate in the late summer and fall. And then the mated queen overwinters in the leaf litter before emerging and then starting uh, her new colony in the summer. So these guys are really reliant on this uh, kind of stable um, soil surface and leaf litter resource. All right, so other ones are also um, surviving in the soil as pupae. Um, if, you, if you dig in any of these areas, you can find these slightly less um, kind of apparent life stages. Um, in the fall, uh, you may see a lot of caterpillars wandering around um, on the, on the uh, roads. Many woolly bears have this uh, behavioral trait. And woolly bears are um, those black and brown caterpillars that people think uh, project the seasons. Um, but really what these guys are doing is they're in a wandering stage. 
And in this wandering stage, um, they're looking for a place to pupate, basically. So this is an agreeable tiger moth caterpillar. They are the fastest caterpillars I've ever come across. Um, and uh, I would definitely suggest finding these guys in the fall. So um, another type of habitat substrate these guys like are fallen leaves. Um, and you know, they don't look that exciting when you just start looking at them. Um, but there's actually um, a, a moth in this picture. It always takes me a while to find it. Um, so here is actually this moth uh, that's pretending to be like, like the leaf litter. Um, but it's not just camouflage that these insects use leaf litter for. Um, this is um, kind of a pile of a pile of leaves that I found out in my yard. Um, does anybody have a guess about what could be it, what, what this pile of leaves could be? You can put it in the chat if so. Um, and basically, the thing to notice here is that there are tons of little um, kind of skeletonized webbing in all of these leaves. So much of the leaf tissue here actually is gone. Yes, RJ said a fallen squirrel nest, and you're totally correct. Um, this is a fallen squirrel nest. And what I've noticed is that if you actually go into these squirrel nests, what you find are um, caterpillars. So um, there are actually caterpillars that feed on dead leaves, not just living leaves. Um, and all this skeletonized tissue is actually uh, from the feeding of these caterpillars that will actually overwinter in leaf litter. So these guys just freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw in the leaf litter. Um, this species is a common, common idea. Um, I think they actually may play a more important role in um, kind of decomposition than we give them credit for. So here at the top, you can see a pupated larva and all of this around it is the frass and kind of um, detritus of oak leaves. And oak leaves are extraordinarily recalcitrant. Um, so this kind of um, frass matter is much better fertilizer for your oak trees in the forest uh, than those oak leaves were. And just so you don't think this is just in my yard, I know I started noticing them in my yard where I have old oaks, um, but this is actually over um, in along the Potomac in a forest area there. Here's another squirrel nest that fell down. And if I open it up, sure enough, I find more caterpillars. Um, so this seems to be a fairly uh, typical interaction that's happening above our heads in forests all the time. Um, okay, so what are some other uh, habitat types um, that we've got? So some of these guys are overwintering actually just in leaf tissue if it remains evergreen. So here you can see a native holly leaf miner fly that forms um, these serpentine mines in um, leaf, uh, leaf tissue. And so there's a number of different strategies that insects use that can use to deal with cold temperatures. Um, so they can basically produce um, glycerol and other sugars and alcohols that allow them to kind of cool off. Um, and what these guys do is probably produce some of those so they can keep um, sort of freezing and thawing a little bit. And then when it's warm enough, they will feed um, during, during the winter as well. Here's another guy that you probably will find in your woods quite easily if you have any golden ragwort around. Um, it should be blooming soon. It's gorgeous. It has uh, bright, bright yellow flowers. And um, these guys also overwinter as larvae. I think this is um, a Phylocnictus uh, insignis, um, which is the golden ragwort leaf miner. And you can see it, it makes these little serpentine mines. And then right now it um, overwintered as a, as a larva here. So I took this picture on February 3rd um, in, in, in a kind of forest patch near to here. And so I suspect that you can still find these um, in, your, in your forest patches as well. And these guys are basically just winter active and feed through the winter. Um, another place that these guys use are twigs and branches. Um, and they can do this in a variety of different stages. Uh, so here I'm gonna focus on eggs first. So these um, are eggs of the Eastern tent caterpillar, which you're probably familiar with um, because they hatch out in the spring. You can see little um, first instar uh, larvae that have hatched out here um, before, 
before this cherry tree has actually even flushed out new leaves. And they will just wait there until those new leaves um, emerge. And then they will come and feed on those new leaves, um, forming a tent, which are these kind of um, often considered unsightly tents on people's, um, people's flowering cherries. Um, but these egg masses are pretty, are pretty um, cool and distinctive to find if you have any black cherry, for example, in, in your forest patches, you can quite easily find these large, um, these large conglomerations. And the, the recommendation that we have if people don't want these guys around, although I think they're quite cool, um, is you go and look for these egg masses and scrape them off in the fall. And that's going to prevent you from having your tree defoliated the next year. Um, other insects lay their, um, lay their eggs singly on individual twigs. And so then when leaves emerge in the spring, this is a, a choke, a choke cherry leaf uh, that a copper underwing uh, laid a single egg on the twig of the previous fall, and then it emerges and starts feeding in the spring. And it's really hard to find these single eggs. Um, I obviously have not found one of these, um, so I'm giving you a picture of the actual caterpillar pretending to be a leaf. Um, but this is just to say that they can actually overwinter just as eggs exposed to the world as well. One of the coolest uh, strategies, I think, is that these guys will overwinter just as larvae on twigs. So this is the one spotted variant. It's one of the most common caterpillars I find um, in the woods. It's a geometrid, so uh, also known as inchworms. And these guys basically um, sit there and just freeze and thaw. Um, they, they have some of these antifreeze compounds within their bodies. Um, and there's just a really good illustration um, in Bern Heingrit's Winter World, if you've read that, um, that these, these caterpillars in particular are about 60% of kinglet's diet in the winter. So up in Maine, they're basically just going and picking these individual um, larvae off the trees. Um, and so it's a pretty dangerous time to be a caterpillar, but this seems to be a good strategy for them because they are one of the most common caterpillars that I encounter. Um, there's other um, caterpillars that overwinter on twigs as well. So this is a red spotted purple life cycle. Um, this is a really common butterfly that you might find around here. Um, but the cool thing that it does is it has a gorgeous egg that's always laid on kind of the tips. I most commonly find them on black cherry trees. So if you have any black cherry uh, saplings around, look for these in, in the spring. Um, these eggs will hatch, a little caterpillar comes out, the caterpillar feeds in this really distinctive way, shredding the leaf um, and leaving the interior of the stem. Um, they will actually create a little um, stick of frass, so of poop at the end of this, and then they will go and sit on the edge on the other side of it when they aren't feeding and it protects them from ants. Um, so what these guys do in the winter is that they actually overwinter as a third instar larvae in this really interesting leaf structure that they create and then tie to a twig. So if you go out now um, and you have some of these um, black cherries on your property, look for some saplings, I suspect you will find evidence of uh, some of these guys overwintering as third instar larvae on your trees. Um, and so then they come back out in the spring, continue feeding, uh, pupate and go through the summer. So uh, some of the other structures you might see in the winter are kind of the cocoon structures that are on, on twigs and branches. So these are some Saturnids have really kind of um, distinctive cocoon structures that they make. Um, and these are ones that I commonly find out on oak trees for the polyphemus moth here. Um, or I typically find these Promethea moth um, cocoons on tulip tree, uh, but I've also found them on, on cherry. So these are gorgeous caterpillars um, that you can um, that you can look for in the in the spring um, if you know that you have a cocoon there in the winter. So another another thing that these insects do is they use tree holes. 
Um, so some, some insects actually overwinter as adults um, with the moths and butterflies. There aren't too many of them, these guys that do this, but the commons, the commas and question marks and morning cloaks are a whole group that will use things like tree holes or maybe your attic. Um, any place they can kind of get warm for the winter, they will, um, they will spend the winter in there and then emerge on kind of the first warm spring days. So uh, last week when we had those days in the 70s, I saw um, some of these uh, commas flying around and morning cloaks. So another um, last kind of habitat are deadwood that's on your property. We usually don't think about this as habitat or important or anything else. Um, but a lot of insects actually use the cracks in um, coarse woody debris to wedge themselves in and overwinter. Um, and you probably know this if you've done much splitting of wood. This is a log that I split uh, recently that had a whole colony of ants um, that were overwintering inside of it, along with a number of spiders that also had chosen this to be their overwintering spot, and some beetles and weevils. Um, so these cracks in dead wood are really important. And I think that um, woods in general are unique, uniquely good habitat for this because in more suburban areas, people tend to get rid of their coarse woody debris. They don't let it um, kind of exist in the landscape in a way that these insects can use. Um, so other ways insects use bark crevices um, or log cracks are as pupa. Here you can see a larva that is just kind of um, overwintering on the, in a crack on a living sapling. And lastly, there's um, a number of daggers that burrow into soft wood to pupate. So this is a paddle caterpillar. Um, this is probably the, the caterpillar that got me excited about um, all of this work in general. Uh, I, was, I was working in some woods doing a litter decomposition study um, at the, during undergrad. And I saw this sort of line of sawdust coming down uh, through the sunlight. And I couldn't figure out what I was singing, seeing. And I got closer and closer and it turned out I was seeing one of these paddle caterpillars um, digging and boring into a, a stem on a tree. And this stream of sawdust was kind of coming down through the sunlight. And I, we didn't have cell phones back then uh, that could take pictures. So I don't have a picture of it. Um, but um, there are many other caterpillars that, that do this behavior and are actually overwintering in wood. So this is a different dagger, the American dagger. Um, and it basically burrows into kind of soft wood and then takes all of its hairs um, from its outer body that um, have uh, kind of burrs and are urticating um, and makes, makes a little uh, crevice for itself to, to hang out in um, and pupate for the winter. And so there's many of these scattered around um, in dead wood on, in your woods as well. So um, lastly, I just want to kind of uh, reiterate why kind of woods are an important habitat for these insects. And um, this is because you can see how fragmented the Maryland landscape is. Um, so most places in Maryland, the woods have been cut over three to five times. Um, and the Chesapeake Bay watershed has lost 100 acres of forest each day since 1985. Now, this isn't to say there aren't for forest gains, um, but the additions to the forest are really coming from um, agricultural land that is converting to forest. And then we have these depletions from development and development is continuing and it's creating this fragmented landscape. And so these forests that do remain are probably serving an outsized importance in kind of connecting these habitats for these insects. So the reason that I think these habitats are so important for insects is there's lower disturbance happening them for the most part. Um, you've often got more intact communities of native ephemeral uh, plants that are really important for a lot of these specialist um, insect pollinators and herbivores. Um, you have native tree species that have co-evolved relationships with the native insects that are here. Um, your leaf litter isn't as disturbed as it is in a lot of other habitat types. Um, and your soil isn't as disturbed in, in some of these wooded habitats. And I think more, most importantly, maybe, um, there is more coarse woody debris here because people will allow kind of standing dead snags to exist. And that's really important habitat. 
you also tend to get a range of tree ages and heights and certain insects are kind of specialists on trees of different ages. Um, so likely if, if you interact with or are conserving a wood patch, you're likely conserving hundreds of species in these areas. And the alternatives here are really highly disturbed. Um, so here's a picture of kind of traditional suburbia and um, much of the fall leaf litter in these areas are uh, removed in the fall. And so um, I have a grad student in the lab, Max Ferlato, who's currently um, studying this process. And basically 8.5 million tons of leaf litter are removed from residential lawns in the US. And so he's interested in kind of figuring out if this is important for insects. And so he's done an experiment out in a forest, um, forested habitat, where he's basically manipulating the uh, leaf litter out on the landscape. So here he's either removing the leaf litter, um, adding more to it, um, mulching it up, um, or having a control litter, and then putting emergence traps out in the spring and seeing what insects successfully emerge. And what you can see is um, that this the leaves are really having an important buffer effect on soil temperature. So um, this orange down at the bottom is, you know, if you remove leaves and what you can just see visually looking at this is there's a lot more variation in soil temperatures when you remove the leaves. And as I mentioned before, these insects are pretty closely tied to temperature cues. Um, so that could have an important effect on these guys. So his preliminary results um, from this first year of his study are that he is seeing a decreased uh, moth and butterfly emergence from removal plots. So if you remove that leaf litter, he's getting fewer um, moths and butterflies emerging from that same plot of land. So this basically demonstrates um, that this could be really important habitat um, for these insects. And that these leaves might play an insulating role, kind of altering insect emergence. What we don't know at this point is whether this is caused through direct mortality, like these are moths and butterflies and parasitoids and things that are um, directly in using that leaf litter itself, or just its indirect mortality by changing the microclimate. And we're hoping to uh, get more knowledge of that as we move forward. So the last, the last point I'll make here is, uh, you know, why would I encourage, many, I get the question many times, like why would I encourage insects that are going to go and destroy my woods? And I hope that I've kind of been able to convince you that these insects are doing many things, um, not just destroying your woods. Um, but I want to mention that, you know, creatures like this hag moth, which is an amazing, amazing caterpillar, um, are not just out to destroy uh, your woods in general as an herbivore. Um, they're also playing a really important role in kind of maintaining a diverse assemblage of natural enemies. So if you have um, sort of a host of these other organisms around to support your predator populations, then when a pest species comes in that's going to cause trouble, um, you basically have sort of an enemy community standing by to get it under control. And so you can actually think about these um, non-pest herbivore species as, as a good in and of themselves because they are maintaining um, your kind of attack team uh, for later in the season. And this principle is at play uh, kind of in the cicada emergence that'll be happening soon. So these guys are definitely in your woods um, and are hanging out below ground currently as nymphs um, and will be emerging in May. Um, and our, our entomology department has a whole kind of outreach cicada crew. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, um, to kind of get onto their website. Uh, they have merchandise, they have frequently asked questions, they have kind of interest surveys if you want to have somebody come and talk to your uh, class or something like that. So I recommend you getting in touch with them. Um, so the question that I have for you is why you might want this in your woods, and I think you definitely should because they're amazing uh, creatures, and I hope that I've convinced you of that. Um, and I will just uh, end with one final insect that I'm sure you will see this spring. Um, this is a spice bush specialist, um, the spice bush swallowtail. And if you walk around your woods uh, this spring, you will likely see these kind of envelopes that are really distinctive. There's a stem and then there's a little envelope. And if you open those up, you will find a little caterpillar 
that is hanging out in this space. And they, they hang out in there, except for maybe like the five minutes a day, they uh, climb up to a different leaf, eat quickly, and then go back to their shelter. And these guys are um, gorgeous animals that are basically uh, mimicking snakes. Um, kind of in the landscape. And so I'm hoping um, that uh, you will uh, kind of appreciate all of these organisms that are using your habitats and that I've convinced you that these insects are really providing kind of hidden services to us as humans that we should try to preserve. Um, but also they have this intrinsic work as beautiful creatures and wildly diverse creatures that have really interesting life histories. Um, the season they just went through is a tough one for them, um, but they're going to emerge uh, strong soon in the spring. And, um, you know, these woods that are even small fr fragments are probably playing really important roles for the maintenance of um, these really extraordinary creatures. And so if you do have the opportunity to kind of manage some of these habitats, if you can do it in a way that um, promotes a diversity of habitats and native species and has lower levels of disturbance um, of leaf litter and soil, I think that'll go a long way towards supporting some of these species. And with that, um, I will take any questions and I'd like to thank my lab and kind of the department. Um, and there's many resources through my website that you can also take a look at. Yay, great. Thank you, Karen. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you're able to access the chat and put that uh, that um, link back up for the cicada. So in May, we're going to be getting one of the presenters that Karen mentioned from that cicada lab uh, to present about cicadas in May. So we're doing insects this month. We're going to do birds in April. And then we're going to do cicadas in May. So that was very appropriate. Um, so that that was a great, and I want I, I hope that she's going to put that link in there so that y'all can get that. Um, so I noticed that it's one o'clock. So I don't want to keep everybody. I just want to make a few announcements before we get into these um, questions. So Karen is going to put that link in there about the cicadas. I already told you about the cicada presentation in May. I told you about the bird present woodland wildlife bird presentation in April. And what I'd also like to let you know is there's going to be an Earth Day celebration. Taylor, our forestry team, Rody, is going to put that link in the Earth Day in the chat. Um, we're doing an Earth Day celebration where it's a family friendly. Um, event where it's a scavenger hunt. So you have two weeks to uh, get the clues. And within that two weeks, we're going to have Michael Raup. Roop, he's part of that cicada Raup. team. Raup. He's part of that cicada team that Karen mentioned. He's an entomologist, um, the bug guy. Um, he's going to be presenting a week before Earth Day about climate change. And then on Earth Day, Carrie Wickstead, she was uh, in attendance today, you might have saw some of her comments in the chat. Carrie Wickstead, she's going to be joining us about the biodiversity of Maryland on Earth Day, and we're going to have a slideshow finale with some raffle prizes. That slideshow finale is going to be the pictures of the clues you got from the scavenger hunt. So join us on Earth Day. Again, Taylor put that um, registration link in the chat. She may put it in again just to make sure that you didn't miss it. So those were my uh, public service announcements. Now, Karen, let's get to some of these questions. You mentioned a book, uh, uh, and I'm, I, I, I didn't hear what the book was. Was it Insects Over Wintering, or what, what was the title of that book? Uh, yeah, so this one is, um, maybe I mentioned Burned Heinrich's Winter World. Yes. Um, it's a, it's a, like, Bern Heinrich is an amazing uh, kind of environmental writer and communicator. Um, he's done a lot of uh, research on hot-blooded insects. Um, so there's, there's basically uh, moths that actually um, overwinter just as active insects, and they basically um, increase their body temperature by shivering. Um, so they're doing much more active management, um, but that book is amazing. Um, it's not just insects. There's sections on mice. There's section on lots of other creatures. So I would recommend it. I can put it in the chat. Oh, that'd be great. I was just going to say, can you repeat the title? So one of our first questions um, was, um, do any birds or other animals 
uh, are they predators for the gypsy moth at any stage? Because gypsy moth may be coming up this year, coming up pretty good. So are there any predators for the gypsy moth at any stage? So yeah, mostly what I've been talking about today is kind of native insects. And um, I really wanted to focus on kind of this diversity that is um, not some of these pest insects and many of our pest insects are non-native. And the reason for this is because they tend to have fewer uh, natural enemies and predators in this region when they, when they come over here. Um, so there are things that will eat gypsy moth, but if you've seen a gypsy moth larva, they are fairly, um, they've got kind of red and uh, blue patterning on them. They're pretty conspicuous, which tends to indicate that they may not taste very good. It's coloration that means they may not taste good. And so they, they're they clearly not enough predators that, that will eat them initially. Um, I believe there's a virus that uh, does a much better job of controlling their population. So if you consider a virus a predator, um, then, then yes, there are some that are doing a much better job. But in general, no, they're not, they don't tend to be bothered um, by a lot of our uh, native predators. There are a few parasitoids. I didn't get into parasitoids, um, but there are a few generalist parasitoids that will attack them. Well, I think one of the biggest predators to the gypsy moth is our squishing ability and our scraping of the, the egg mass on the, on, the, on the tree trunks. So I wanted to let you know that that link on our website can take you to our YouTube, our YouTube channel. And in November, there was a pest update, a forest pest update. So um, that, that if you wanna hear more about the pests of Maryland, Go to our uh, presentation that happened in, no in November with Heather Disk, November 2020. I think we have a couple pest updates, but if you want to find out more, uh, check out that check out that uh, that that website. I, I thought it was really informative, so um, I hope you you would too. Okay, so then our next question: What kind of metamorphosis would you consider a dragonfly, stonefly, mayfly to have? The nymphs look nothing like an adult, but there are no pupil stage. Um, so those those guys are going through a uh, complete complete metamorphosis. Um, yeah, so the aquatic insects are interesting. Um, let me check back on that. Um, I don't want to tell you something incorrectly. Um, but those guys are not the ones that I tend to, that I tend to study. Um, but yes, they look totally different. Um, and I would, I would not imagine that they would be considered gradual metamorphosis. Fair enough. The relationship between forests and aquatic insects are definitely different than what we talked about today. So, so that, that's a great distinction, the aquatic insects. Um, and you know maybe that's what brought up the the reason for the question because they are they they do a lot of that stuff in the water. So I mean, but so they they are they don't they do not they do not do the complete reordering though like like we're talking about where they they're in the pupa and then basically everything dissolves and there's some um, cells that are basically the organizational cells and everything rearranges around those. Um, there's like these disc cells. Um, and that does not happen with any of those more kind of primitive insect groups, maybe primitive basal, let's call them basal, not primitive. Um, so yeah, I think it's gradual. I think it's considered gradual, but it's a little bit different in terms of their habitat usage. They do use very different habitats uh, between the nymph and the adult stages. Great, great. I think uh, Professor Lamp at University of Maryland, um, he, I think he has a website that he does aquatic research on those aquatic animals. So if you do have any questions, William, Dr. William Lamp, um, he has a whole team behind him too that maybe can help with some of those aquatic qu uh, insect questions. So the next one here, or did you want to still, are you still looking? <laughs> Oh, I'm just looking at the questions. Okay. I, I can see them as well, but it's better if you read them out. You want um, me to give you some time. Okay. So are the blister beetle larvae parasites of the pollen or do they just eat the pollen? Are they parasites of the pollen or do they just 
eat the pollen? So I would say they are they are parasites of the bee. So um, by eating the pollen that has been used as a provision or has been put as a provision for the larva of the, the bee species, what they're actually doing is they're kind of parasites on, on those bees um, by eating the resources that they are, are relying on. Okay, so, so by- Yeah, so they, they are a parasite, they are a brood parasite of the bee, they're not a parasite of the pollen itself. Okay, the brood being the whole family kind of thing. So, so the uh, these bees will lay. So they'll they'll kind of make a chamber where they put all of kind of the pollen and resources, and then they will have a brood chamber where the eggs are laid. So the brood is like the the eggs, and then the larvae of um, of the bees that okay. are living underground. Wow, interesting, interesting, and interesting. F- first off that the pollen gets into this like little sack thing that you're talking about and then there's a whole different one for the brood to go in so that's even just like construction at its finest wow wow okay moving on to our next one doesn't hemolymph contain a natural antifreeze i think you kind of suggested that a little bit throughout your talk there near yeah, so we didn't get too much into kind of the actual physiological mechanisms of these overwinterings. That's super fascinating. And um, I've given kind of talks completely on that side of it. Um, but basically, there's a number of different uh, strategies that these insects use. So they can either use super cooling um, strategies, or they can have antifreeze, or they can actually promote freezing so that they freeze more slowly and in a controlled way. Um, and do so without um, kind of having nucleation sites. So so basically what you don't want to have if you're a freezing insect is you don't want to have any parts inside your body that can serve as um, a nucleation site for ice. Mm. Because if that happens, then your cell contents get destroyed. And so what you want is like a very slow freezing process uh, where water can be sucked out of the cells, you can desiccate, you can basically freeze outside the cells rather than inside the cells. Um, And so some insects have antifreeze, but some of them actually um, have things that promote them freezing faster, but in a controlled way. Not faster, at at a lower temperature that allows them to slowly freeze rather than a quick freeze. So there's lots of different physiological um, strategies for that. Before we go on to the next question here, one of the questions, you said something that I thought was interesting. Some adult insects don't even eat. As an adult human myself, <laughs> not eating, it just seems so odd. So their life cycles just are, are, are super small, short when they're an adult, so they don't need to eat. Is that what you're saying? Or Yeah, so one of the cool things about complete metamorphosis is you can kind of um, partition out different parts of your life cycle. So basically, you could think of the caterpillars as basically like the eating phase that's really just about gathering energy. Um, And then you can have an adult phase that is specialized for mobility, so has wings. Um, Maybe so some of these butterflies uh, will feed on nectar, but some of them, many moths actually don't even have functional mouth parts. Um, so they don't, they don't feed at all as adults and they just have kind of a window in which they, um, need to mate and then they die. Um, think about mayflies as well. Um, again, not an aquatic, uh, not an aquatic entomologist, but those guys also, you know, they come out and they mate and they die and they're, they're not really focused on being able to feed during that stage. But yes, I, I, as an adult do like to eat. Um, but, but these guys have kind of decided, you know, we're going to put everything into being able to find our mate most effectively, um, and, uh, lay our eggs in the proper timing. Sounds like a bit like the cicadas that sounded like the cicadas. So I, they, they, you know, they only come out for 24 hours, but I don't want to give it away because we're doing cicada talk. <laughs> yeah, I could, I, I, I won't, I won't, uh, kind of, uh, put in there, but Okay, so another question here, if you're following along, it's at 1.07 p.m. Uh, you had a photo of one insect in a phase that looked like a forest of crocheted hooks on a leaf. What is that? You had a photo of a one insect in a phase. RJ, 
Um, do you Forest have... of croquet, crochet hooks. Um, this guy? Don't know. Is RJ here? I don't know. Maybe we'll get to it at the end as we go through RJ. So hopefully you're still here and you could put something in the chat to kind of clarify um, around when you saw it. How about that? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, we're getting a lot of a lot of feedback that it was great. Taylor there, she put the link to the Forest Pest webinar. Hopefully she'll put the link again to Earth Day in there just to kind of because we've got a lot of messages since the last time. Um, okay. So somebody somebody asked if they were parasites or competitors. That was the next one I was going to get to. So um, I think that I, I'm assuming this is the bees again. Um, I would say that um, both of these guys, so the cuckoos, so basically I told you about two, two things. I told you about the blister beetles that feed on the pollen, but don't necessarily kill the um, colides directly. And then I told you about cuckoo bees um, that actually go in and lay eggs in the nests and their offspring do kill the, um, the cuckoo bees or do kill the colides um, bees. And so I would say that both of those be considered parasites of the colides, um, but with one another, they are competing with one another. So I would say that uh, the blister beetle and the cuckoo bees are kind of in competition for the resource of the uh, colides. Colides seem like they don't have any um, sort of defenses here, but I suspect they probably do as well. So the next question, which I think is rattling around in a lot of people's minds is does moving fallen leaves with a leaf blower kill overwintering insects? So if I'm, I'm imagining this person is blowing them, maybe they have a forest edge on their lawn and they're blowing the, the leaves from their lawn into the forest. That's, that's, that's how I'm picturing it. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we actually have very little data on this. Um, I, we have looked for studies that look at this question and they don't really exist yet. So we're hoping uh, we have folks in the lab who are kind of investigating this question. And so I hope we can give you a really clear answer soon. Um, what I would say is that probably if you're just moving them into a new location, not uh, kind of putting them to the curb and, and sending them to the landfill, um, that you probably are not kind of killing things that are kind of rolled up in leaves or are in a dormant stage in a leaf mine or things like that. So if you're just moving them into the woods, I think that's actually a great way of handling um, leaf litter in general. You don't wanna maybe make um, the leaf pile so thick that maybe they can't emerge in the spring. Um, so I think one of the things I suggest is yeah, move, if, if you have a patch that you really want to have as grass or something like that, um, move the leaves early into more of your wooded setting and spread them out in a more equal layer. Um, because right now, at least with like the addition treatments that we're doing in this experiment, um, doubling the amount of litter doesn't seem to negatively impact uh, the emergence. Um, so I think that, you know, raking is probably going to be a little bit less destructive to the soil surface. That's actually what I would be concerned about um, for leaf blowing. If you're using extremely high powered uh, like commercial leaf blowers, um, th those guys just have so much power that they can disturb um, the soil surface and perhaps uh, cause some damage there to the soil surface rather than the ones in the actual leaves. Does that help? When, when is the best time then to move the leaves? You said early on. So is that early uh, spring we're moving the leaves? Is that early autumn we're moving the leaves? When do you suggest if I'm going to move them, when, when, when am I going to do that? Yeah, this is, this is really tricky. I mean, so I think what we're trying to figure out is when are these insects making the decision about where to kind of overwinter? And I think that if you know, so, so what I've tried to do in kind of my, uh, my yard is have many spots that actually I just um, kind of have as a leaf litter type habitat. Um, but I do have moss areas and things for walking paths and I don't want leaves there. 
Um, I think if you know it's a spot that you don't want to have leaves, moving them as quickly as possible is useful. Um, because then if insects or say spiders, so a lot of spiders use this leaf litter um, and they're making decisions about kind of where to overwinter, maybe in December as they're kind of moving around, you don't want them to kind of choose um, your space if then in December you're going to move that, right? Um, and so I think if you're, if you know you're not going to let it all go all winter, um, then I would move it as early as you can, just so things that are making decisions later um, kind of know that that habitat is not going to be there. Um, yeah, if you can, I mean, so even in my beds, I let, I kind of let the leaf litter go through the spring and I uncover, say, the rosettes or the evergreens, that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's tricky and, and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get more data on it, but we really, we really don't know a lot. Um, the no. le, 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 less disturbance is better for sure. Well, we're, we're all going to be holding our breath to hear the, the, the recommendations that come out of this uh, fellow study that you mentioned. So RJ got to us. So the crocheted hooks on the leaves, he had said that it was earlier on. Got it. Presentation. It was earlier on. Oh, this one maybe? Question mark? RJ, I I don't know if <laughs> you're able to put something in the chat for that. But um oh oh it was a type of gall. Okay, I know. I know what it I bet it was like the first um So many pictures you shared with us. This was great. Yeah, thanks. I haven't done this exact presentation before, so it was fun to put together. Uh, so maybe this. Ah. Well, the area fired might falls, perhaps. Just passed it, he said, on the bottom right. Yeah. Yes, he said. So we're on it. Yes, so these uh, you'll find this is on black cherry. Um, it's a really common uh, mite, um, a gall caused by a mite. Um, but there's a bunch of species that are on birch and, and other and other species as well. And basically, they just cause the plant to make these crazy structures on the leaves. Um, I actually have a yes, black cherry is delicious. It's actually one of my favorite. Uh, trees to sample. It just has a really cool insect community and really pretty distinctive because um, they have a lot of um, cyanide compounds. So this is one of the reasons why the Eastern tent caterpillar like gets out ahead of the game. Um, if you ever have smelled uh, kind of um, newly emerging cherry leaves, they often smell a little almondy and it's like these cyanide compounds. Um, so only really specialized caterpillars can often feed on them. Um, so you're just reading that now. The cherries now have large black lumps all over the branch tips. Is that related? Or is it the branch tips or like around the branch? Um, cause there's a, there's a disease, there's a cherry disease. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, somebody said black knot. Um, so, so those actually, that probably is a disease. There's also American cherry, um, which I have, I come across less, but it also has very cool caterpillars. And I think people like to use that in their landscapes more, but I think black cherry is an underrated tree in our forests, um, in general, a fungus. Yeah. So a disease and specifically a fungus. Great, Karen. This, uh, oh, we got, I missed another one here. So reports, so at 118, uh, reports of broad declines in many species of insects are increasing and worrisome. I assume that habitat loss is the most important problem for most, but what roles are pesticides and climate change playing to exacerbate the problem? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it's probably one of those situations of, a thousand cuts, maybe sort of like um, 
the brood declines colony collapse disorder in bees. Um, and like, I, I hope I kind of got across sort of the diversity of all these different um, types of life cycles. And so you can imagine that for many of these inse insects, there will be a different part of their life cycle that is more vulnerable to some of these different threats uh, than others. So there was a recent paper that just came out like last week in science um, out of Matt Forrester's group in Reno. And they were looking at a combination of iNaturalist uh, pictures, uh, Art Shapiro's kind of long-term uh, butterfly survey surveys and uh, kind of the um, LEP club surveys uh, that have been happening out West. And actually what they found was pretty major declines in these butterfly species, uh, maybe 2% a year, which is alarming. Um, in abundance of these species, but actually they found a, a pretty clear link to warming falls. Yeah. So this kind of gets at uh, that whole life cycle perspective that I think is important. Um, so it seems to be messing up these butterfly populations is that something is happening with the timing because climate change is resulting in warmer falls in these areas and they are no longer kind of able to, to have their life cycles um, go through all the necessary stages. Um, so I would say that is that study itself is done um, you know, in unhabitat disturbed areas. And I think climate change is a pretty clear driver there. Um, in more urbanized areas, we definitely, I mean, habitat destruction is of course just hugely problematic. Um, you know, we have the uh, maglev line that could be coming, coming in, um, going all the way from Washington to Baltimore. And they're planning on uh, cutting down a bunch of Patuxet and the Bark Ag Station uh, to put in a giant train station and things. And like that, <laughs> that's just uh, a major habitat loss that's going to change hydrology and all of these other aspects of these insects' habitat. So I don't think you can discount habitat loss as an important part of these interactions. Um, and pesticides, I think, is interesting. Um, you know, I... I, I've done a lot of work uh, kind of with, with Doug Tallamy on the importance of native plants for some of these uh, insect herbivores. And I sometimes worry that we're, you know, we've encouraged people to plant natives, which is great and I love it. And this is, that's what I plant kind of in my, in my yard. Um, but I think if we're not thinking about the whole life cycle of these insects, we could be getting ourselves in trouble by creating more population sinks. So, you know, if we're creating this or we're planting this great oak tree, but then we're removing every single leaf that falls to the ground um, and throwing it kind of to the dump, um, then that's probably not good for these insects either. So I think that can't be a threat that is um, overlooked as well. And so that's why we're trying to do some of these studies to really understand more rigorously what the threats are. Okay, two more questions before we go. Um... Do you have any kind of uh, insect uh, beginners, you know, in, in insect beginner books that you can offer to people? Because I think you raised something really great. We need to know their life cycles and where where they're doing what in what part of their life cycle. So um, understanding this and educating us will will help make these decisions. Do you have any? resources you can recommend. I saw at the end of your thing, you had some resources. I don't know if those help. And then the second part to that question. So what are some resources for people to learn more about the life histories of Maryland native insects? And are there any citizen science um, websites? You mentioned iNaturalist. I understand that iNaturalist may not be uh, specifically citizen science. However, it does contribute, like you said, to that, to that article you said, but uh, you know, I'm thinking of the phenology network or any sort of thing, if people want to get involved with either finding out more and maybe if you have any um, citizen science recommendations for people. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, it's tricky um, because finding out this information on life cycles is, is non-trivial. Non um, it's, unfortunate that we don't pay attention to these native insects, I think, as much as we should. So I think getting started by getting um, some field guides 
um, are great. I think that probably your best bet, um, I mean, so Caterpillars, uh, Wagner has a really nice Caterpillar book that I would totally recommend uh, if I've convinced people that Caterpillars are, are awesome. So this one um, is amazing. Can we closer so we can- yeah. So this is Caterpillars of Eastern North America. Um, Wagner also has a Noctuid specific book um, that's probably a little more specialized than most people would want, but he actually has um, as, as detailed life history information as I've been able to find for a lot of the caterpillars. For some of these other like leaf miners, leaf mining caterpillars, there's not really good data for where these guys overwinter. So one of the projects my lab is trying to do is actually do a literature search, go to these old papers and try to mine out a lot of this life history information that we actually don't have recorded a lot of places. Um, I do think iNaturalist is great. There's also a Maryland biodiversity website um, that actually feeds directly from iNaturalist observations. Um, and you know, if you're just trying to go out and start understanding uh, what organisms are out there. iNaturalist has a, um, an AI species identification tool called SEEK, S-E-E-K. Um, and you kind of point your phone at something and it'll give you a tentative ID. And I find that to be pretty good for people just starting out. You have to kind of take it with a grain of salt um, that, you know, sometimes it won't give you the correct thing, but at least gets you close often. And I think then you can look on the internet and look for more resources, um, to kind of follow things up. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, some, if, if people have specific kind of groups of organisms that they want a recommendation for, I kind of have books for most kind of groups and I'm happy to, uh, kind of give you specifics. So if you want to reach out, um, more directly to my email. I'm happy to send you what I've got. Can you flip us back to that slide there, letting us know yep. what you um, uh, Right, so that iNaturalist is an app for your phone that Seek, uh, Seek, is, Seek is the app run by iNaturalist. So it's actually a different app than iNaturalist. Um, Great, so iNaturalist is um, for your phone and it's free. And then Seek is like the companion to iNaturalist. It's also an app for your phone. Yes, also a free app for your phone. So um, those are, are, are great recommended. And you mentioned the Maryland um, biodiversity site too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, so in terms of citizen science projects, I know that the uh, Natural History Museum of um, Maryland is has a monarch watch kind of project that's going on um, my student max um, is doing a project in people's yards so that's a community science project but that's already underway um, i know that this this um you know spring with the emergence of the cicadas there is a kind of crowdsourcing um app that people can contribute to as well but i'll let the cicada folks uh, kind of get you started on that great all right, so we're getting again some great presentations. Thanks. This was great, Karen. People really enjoyed it, learned a lot, saw some great pictures. So, um, and that was the the end of our questions. So, Karen, great job. I appreciate you being here, letting us know about insects. You showed us some cute ones. You didn't make me scared. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those wasps, though, if somebody gets that down relatively quick, I think that'll be super impressive. You know, there's so many and how she said that, that millions of them can come out. Oh, my gosh, you guys. So enjoy this spring. Go out. Uh, I love how Karen made it accessible to us. Her backyard. You know, we could just go in the backyard and flip over some leaves and check what's out and looking for that frass. You gave us some great tips, Karen. Thank you so much for being part of Woodland Wildlife Wednesdays. We'll see you folks next week for uh, the birds, birds in your backyard with uh, the um, Samantha Pitt from the uh, Audubon, Pickering Creek Audubon. Great, thanks guys. Thanks for the invitation. Nice to see everyone. Oh, great.